Welcome to the Homegrown Podcast, a place where we share the truth about food and farming from our kitchen to yours. I'm your host, Liz Hazelmeyer, along with my husband, Joey. Good morning. And together, we hope to inspire, educate, and equip you in your pursuit of true nourishment. Today's guest is Craig McCloskey of Ancestral Supplements. Craig earned a Bachelor's of Science degree in Nutrition and Dietetics from Penn State. He's also a Mastered Certified Health Coach and Board Certified in Holistic Nutrition. Since then, Craig has gone on to help educate others on the importance of traditional living as the global educator at Ancestral Supplements, the founder and leader of the Beef Organ Supplement Movement. Craig, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, right on. I'm I'm super excited to have you on. I know that we've been having ancestral supplements in our home for for a long time, and there's so many questions that kind of surround supplements, and we'll definitely get into a lot of those. But man, I'd love to just kind of get started. You know, like all the different things that that the path, the journey of real food and nutrition and nourishment that you've been on. And I'd like to take me back to the start of that. How'd you get into this whole mess here? And uh, then we'll we'll get into your your story as you get into ancestral supplements. Yeah. Yeah. I love that question. Thank you. Um, so my path, I mean, I grew up as an athlete my entire life, but even with that, you know, athletes can grow up in maybe not the healthiest of homes. And so I grew up, my, my parents, they were 15 and 16 when I was born. So super young. And so I was primarily raised by my mom's parents, my grandparents on that side. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the healthiest. They loved me. They cared for me. It was a loving environment but they smoked inside the house and mm -hmm. it just wasn't the healthiest environment. So I was all, always struggling with allergies and coming down with colds and flus uh, throughout my childhood. I missed like the maximum amount of days in elementary school you could miss before you would have to repeat the grade. So it was like 30 days I would miss. And I mean, going through the McDonald's drive through was the regular for me. Mm -hmm. And so just common, typical standard American diet lifestyle type stuff. But uh, so I was an athlete, but I always understood kind of how nutrition would impact my performance. And then in my teenage years, I ended up transitioning and moving in with my dad at the time, which was a, a healthier, more stable kind of living environment. So I was 13 when I moved in with him and I even took my athletic endeavors a little bit more and I really just leaned into that. I ended up becoming a college athlete, a two sport collegiate athlete, swimming and baseball. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really until then that I realized just how lifestyle and nutrition and sleep and all that can really impact not only my performance, but just not getting sick or just feeling good throughout the day and not having digestive issues. But really what started this for me was in 2015. Well, I guess 2014, I found podcast and and that kind of the world of nutrition and health mm -hmm. outside of my typical education at at my university but in 2015 is what really started it for me because um, at that point in time i'm a sophomore in college i'm an athlete i'm doing all the things i'm a nutrition major and a, a kinesiology minor which is basically just the study of of the human body exercise and movement and how the body works but at this point in 2015 february of 2015 um, I, I, I'm commuting from my parents' house to college. And so my dad comes in one morning, like 630 in the morning. And that doesn't happen. As like a 20 year old, your dad doesn't come in and wake you up. So, so something was just off from the beginning. And my, he told me that my uncle had passed away the night before, like he just didn't wake up that morning. And I remember just it, this memory so vivid for me, because he was like a second dad to me. His name was Nathan. And he was starting to cry. My dad, as he was telling me this, and he said he didn't know his aunt or my aunt, his sister just found her husband like not waking up in the morning. So it was completely devastating for us. And and turns out we found out a couple weeks later, he had a massive heart attack and he was only 43. He had two kids under the age of 10. And that really put me back a little bit because I was already, you know, in tune with my own health. I was already a nutrition major at that point because I, I wanted to maybe do something with sports, nutrition, sports, and things like that. But that put me back a couple months. And then at that point, I really just kind of turned it on the summer of 2015. And I started listening to all the podcasts that I could, reading all the books that I could, and really learning more outside of my college education because I wanted to know what killed him, like what caused his heart attack. Mm -hmm. And that kind of led me on the path that I am today. And from then, I actually got a chance in college to start working with um, Sean Stevenson at the Model Health Show. I don't know if you're familiar with his mm -hmm. podcast, um, but I worked with him for four years, my last couple of years in college, and then a couple of years out of college. 
And then since then I've transitioned to working for ancestral supplements and kind of doing my own thing. But, but that my uncle's passing in 2015, almost nine, not over nine years ago now is really kind of what started me on this journey. Wow. And, and so, so your mom's living at your mom's house, a lot of running through drive throughs Now you're playing baseball and swimming at this time, all through like, like early elementary high school and then into college. Yeah. And so um, dietary stuff changed, you said, when you went to your dad's house? In what way did they change? We had more home-cooked meals. Um, we didn't do fast food as much. Um, that, that was probably the biggest change. Uh, they were more strict because grandparents tend to spoil you a little bit, as mine okay. did. And so just my lifestyle changed a little bit, and I had to kind of learn to work for myself. I started work you know, jobs and things like that. But I, that's when I started to grow up a little bit and, and just learn things for myself. But nutritionally, we ate more home cooked meals and they weren't the best, but it was still home cooked. It was still seed oils and sugar and, and <laughs> grain, like processed grains and things yeah. like that. But it just wasn't the best, but it was better than it was. Mm -hmm. So as you kind of went into your educational journey and we, we read off some of these, these, these different things or, or, or degrees that you've picked up along mm -hmm. the way. Uh, where'd you start? Like, what was the first kind of entrance into nutrition? The first, uh, well, so when I started at, at Penn State, I went in undecided because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, mm -hmm. After high school, I actually joined the Air Force and I ended up getting medically discharged uh, after like a year being in. And then I was kind of distraught. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but mm -hmm. then I ended up deciding to just go to Penn State and I walked on my sports teams there and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do something in the health field. And I was thinking I'm an athlete. I love, I love food. And because I was thinking about going to culinary school before that. And I was like, you know what, why don't I blend the two? I ended up taking a nutrition class my freshman year because I was taking prerequisites for a health field. I knew I wanted to do something in the health field. So I took a nutrition class, not even really thinking much of it, but I just really fell in love with it. It was the mm. only class I got a hundred percent in. I knew I loved doing the dietary recall assignments that we had. So I just decided to declare my major. I thought it would help my sports performance. And it just coincided with kind of my, my uncle passing that really yeah. was the catalyst for, for me wanting to do this long term. Mm. Dietary recall. What is that? So that was an assignment that we had. And that's something that um, my fiance, she's a dietitian, but she works with her patients on this. But basically, you just ask them a food recall. This is something that observational studies or epidemiology studies do. They'll give you a food recall, a dietary recall of maybe two days or a couple weeks and ask you to track your food down. Mm. And then you can get an idea of, of what they've eaten and how that might uh, correlate to their health problems that they're mm. having. Mm -hmm. I see. Oh, that's super interesting. It's almost like a food journal mm -hmm. yeah. to help discover what it is that could be causing certain symptoms that you're that you're seeing or experiencing exactly yeah. got it got it i love that that's like a you know sherlock holmes of the food world the the uh so going into penn state you took a nutrition class and that was that was it so so you you took that class crushed it mm -hmm. and and then pursued just what what, what what was the change that you made was it like i'm going in nutrition is that, is that a is that a field of study at penn state just nutrition yeah. So there's a couple different levels there. You can do nutrition and dietetics. You can do applied sciences, but yeah, nutrition is a, a degree, my major that I got there. And then okay. along coincide with that, I got a kinesiology minor as well. So uh, going back to the, you know, the intro there, what, what is kinesiology? <laughs> really just the study of the human body. And there's different levels there. You can do exercise science um, and things like that, but that's just the study of the human body, how it works. Hmm. I went through, you know, biochemistry classes and really learned like EKGs and, and things like that, how to read an EKG or an ECG, whichever, you know, if you're German, but things like that. <laughs> so, so that's really what that is. It's just the study of the human body. And I found that fascinating. You know, I went through a cadaver class, which was wow. kind of weird in, in the moment, but looking back, I'm really grateful for that because it, it really just kind of primed me for learning as much as I could about the human body. Wow. Yeah. That would be intense. Now, yeah. you. Is that a lot of mobility and like joints and, or like what, I mean, is it just everything in the human body? Cause I feel like there's so much that you can go through. What, what were some of the highlights in that kinesiology, you know, major that you were learning? Yeah, that definitely that could, cadaver class, but, um, really just, I loved learning about bones and joints. Like you had mentioned, 
but just how the body works and moves. And mm -hmm. cause I, I loved applying that to my workouts. And oh, so God. if I were to just go to my workout, I would understand why certain movements were helping muscles grow or work better. So this performance, right? So here he is a college athlete mm -hmm. learning how to train like scientifically mm -hmm. in class mm -hmm. and then going back to train. Uh, it's all making sense now, right? So, so also Penn State swimming and baseball can't be like, you know, pushed to the side. Surely that was that, that in and of itself is an impressive feat, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It was a lot of competition for sure. So you must have been, you know, pretty bored, right? Just you know, <laughs> you know training, school, and all that. Um, so, so getting into uh, nutrition, right? And I think something for me because I I have not been formally trained in nutrition, and uh, neither has Elizabeth. But we've talked to a ton of people that are in different fields, whether it be I'm going to call it like the crunchy nutrition space. And then there's the, I'm going to call it like, there's, there's definitely a conventional mm -hmm. nutrition space. And I would have to assume that Penn State would be that conventional nutrition space. Were there any, was there anything that you learned there that now you're like, ah, I'm not so sure about that. And, or vice versa of like, wow, there's some things that I've learned at Penn State that are totally being forgotten in the kind of crunchy world that we're, that we're, that we're living in today. Oh, absolutely. This was a, a, a big moment for me when when my uncle passed and in 2015, I'm a sophomore going into my junior year. And like I mentioned, I started studying outside resources outside of my curriculum. And it takes a long time for, for the studies that have just been done within the past few years to make its way into a college curriculum. It takes decades sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I'm reading these books, listening to these podcasts that have updated information that are presenting opposing views. And so as I'm in college going through my nutrition courses, I am at wit's end. I'm, I'm struggling because it's opposing information. And I'm thinking, what is right? I'm doing what the podcasts are recommending. I'm doing what the books are recommending. I'm trying, I'm experimenting. I'm trying the raw milk, the sourdough. I'm making my own kefir, things like that. And it's working for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And what I was doing when I was a freshman and a sophomore, I was doing the, the 10 to 12 servings of grains per day, yeah. limiting my meat, eating the margarine, which I cringe to say, that wasn't working for me. Even though I was an athlete, I was still somewhat fluffy and a little bit overweight. It just wasn't, wasn't working for me. And so I was struggling hard to figure out what, what is going on here. So I went to my nutrition classes. And, and with that, I had nutrition classes. I had biochem. I had um, uh, chemistries, different, different classes. And I will say that the, the science classes at my university were, were spot on. They taught me so much about the in-depth working of the human body, but there were even the science professors that I had would say that it just didn't align with the nutri nutrition recommendation classes because the, I was learning that, you know, dietary fat can be an incredible source of fuel mm -hmm. in my science classes. But then I go to my nutrition recommendations and they say, you'd have to limit it because it's bad for you. And it just was opposing. And so I just like to experiment, try different things. And so, yeah, I was really struggling with, with that, with my nutrition classes. And as I was going through this, it was just super, super difficult. And I would always be the kid that would kind of ask questions, maybe egging them on a little bit. And sometimes I get a little bit silenced and I'm, I was just frustrated, but, but yeah, I made it through. And uh, now I'm just grateful that I had both sides of that spectrum and got to learn a well-rounded source of information. So that way, when I'm now that I'm out, I can really help understand where not only patients and clients come from, but also, you know, where their health professionals are coming from. Isn't mm -hmm. that fascinating that there's like zero cross pollination in the education world. So you've got these scientists that are, that are putting these classes on, you know, biochemistry, right. And you're learning about the different impacts that ma different macros have on your body in different scenarios. And Hey, if you're, if you're performing or your, your output is here, then your, your, the, the inputs, mm -hmm. right. That you need to have like, here's what you need, right? And you're like, writing it down, like, write that down, write that down. Yeah. And you walk into nutrition, they're like, all right, everything you just learned, scratch that. <laughs> here's what we're going to do, right? If you, if you want to be in really good shape, here's the things you got to eat. And it's funny and crazy because you even mentioned this, like, hey, there's studies happening and to get or to penetrate into the education world, mm -hmm. years. And and we all know this, right? If you work at a corporation or if you work in you know, you know big business, education, the, the government, right? It's just, it's like a pirate ship trying to turn that thing around. It's like, you know, you're, you're spinning the wheel and, and then the mast has to turn. And then it's like, the, turn that ship around. It, it takes so much time and effort. And it, it, it's oftentimes not necessarily because there's, there's someone that's 
you know, at the top that is anti, but more or less that all of the different stages of change that have to occur to make a proper change makes it take a long time. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe there are some people out there that are, you know, maybe a little bit dirty and don't want it to be that way, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm going to give 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 uh, folks the benefit of the doubt. Do you think, and again, maybe you don't know this, the answer to this question, is it like that today? Like even like, cause like this was, you know, years, what, what time, what year was this when you were going through nutrition at Penn State? 2013 to 2019. So 2013, 2019. Uh, so that's, that's relatively recent. I mean, 2019, mm -hmm. it feels recent, right? Mm -hmm. Was that five years ago? Mm -hmm. So 20, 2019 feels recent to me. I don't know. Maybe people out there are like five years ago. That's not recent. But my get, my, my question would be, is that, is that kind of how it is today even that? In nutrition I, classes, are they still kind of not cross pollinating with the science labs? I would imagine. Um, even my nutrition press professors were still learning some of the same things. You know, the my plate, the food pyramid back in the nineties. It was oh all virtually the same thing that they were learning and that they were teaching. Um, just with, I actually had. I mean, there was a lot of amazing nutrition professors that I did have. So not all of them are, you know, by the book like that. But some mm -hmm. of them definitely brought in new science and just critical thinking skills. But, but yeah, I'd imagine that it's still like that five years later. Mm. Was there any definition within the nutrition class of what healthy is? Like, like mm -hmm. here's the standard uh, like definition of healthy. Therefore, you can, you can self kind of test these ideas to see if it's successful. Is, is there anything like that, like a, an objective that's put out before you guys as a class? I don't know if there's a, a definition of what healthy is, and that's kind of um, subjective to the the professor themselves and what they maybe or maybe don't have a bias towards because they have to teach within that certain curriculum and get the information mm -hmm. across. But I remember coming to class sometimes and just uh, vividly the one the one class uh, I'm well in, I'm, I'm a senior at this point, and my one professor randomly I, I we were talking about dairy, and she asked if anybody had ever tried raw milk before. And my hand shot up because I was super excited. Well, my hand was the only one to shoot up. And oh, yeah. she immediately singled me out and was like, why? Like, what are, you, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I get it from the farmer's market. I've been doing it for a couple of years. Good friends with, with the, them, you know, go every Saturday. And then she went on this 15, 20 minute lecture about how it's not healthy. You, you know, you poison yourself basically. And so that kind of set the standard for what is healthy and what isn't to me. And I was you know, a little frustrated that, at that point, but that was 2016 and that's eight years ago. And I've been drinking raw milk ever since and I've never had an issue. And yeah, <laughs> it's like at that point you want to be like, well, you know, Dr. Jennings over in the, you know, whatever lab <laughs> and I were talking about the science of probiotics and bacteria and, or enzymes. You know, health and enzymes. And it's like, have you have you talked to Dr. Jennings? Because like she could probably tell you why a lot of what you're saying doesn't make a whole lot of sense right, right now. That hurts my heart to hear that. Like she, I at first when you said that, I was like excited for you. I was like, oh, she's gonna like have a a different opinion. And then she basically like ran you through the ringer, right? And was like, mm, you're gonna expose yourself to foodborne illness. That's such a bummer. But we're this we're the same way. We're like almost eight years in and and no issues. But yeah, man, there is times with that and and salt and basically saying that all salt is the same and, and all grains are the same and sourdough is the same as refined grains. And there was a lot of what? conventional education there that I had to unlearn and, mm -hmm. and rewind a little bit and just kind of approach things from an open angle and, and try things on myself and, and dive a little bit deeper. But it's, it's pretty, pretty conventional there. Doesn't it make you wonder if these people have ever cooked in the kitchen? <laughs> like, have you ever actually just like made real bread or tasted real milk? Because even if you take the nutrition out of it, like there's for sure a difference, you mm -hmm. know, I just or, think. Or even just been in nature, you know, right. how do you get your food yeah. from nature? And I think you can't get canola oil from nature in your own kitchen. You just can't no. make it. It goes through 40 stages of processing. Whereas butter, if you have a cow or have access to a local farm, it goes through just milking the cow, shake mm -hmm. it up in a jar, and you have butter and buttermilk. And it's yeah. so simple. I don't I mean, even at that point, lard, right? It's like, yeah. you know, hey, we would throw this away because, you know, it's hard to chew up. And it's like, no, okay, well, maybe if you, you know, use this and you, you render it down and create yeah. this cooking. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Crazy stuff. So 
uh, you're unlearning a lot and learning a lot all at the same time, all simultaneously. Mm-hmm. You're, you're an athlete. So graduating college, you know, what did you want to do? I was blessed. Uh, like I mentioned, I was blessed to have an opportunity to work for, for Sean Stevenson at his podcast, kind of like his right hand nu- nutritionist helping his audience out. Mm. And I knew I wanted to do something in this field. I knew I wanted to educate. I knew I wanted to just help people because I didn't want anyone to feel the way that I felt with my uncle. Mm-hmm. And I have a passion for, for teaching people. I have a passion for nutrition. I have a passion for cooking, anything in the health field. And so I just spent the next two to three years after I graduated in 2019 and was really just mentored by him and his team. And uh, that's, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do something in this space. Mm. And so just a couple years ago is when I transitioned to ancestral supplements. And uh, I've been really filling out my role here as kind of the educator for them, helping you know, educate the audience on traditional living, ancestral living, and just what it means to, to hopefully live a healthy lifestyle. Mm-hmm. So let's let's jump into that. Let's talk about ancestral living. You know, what what, what how do you define ancestral living? What would you yeah. like? How, someone that's listening to this right now that that hears that and thinks oh, that's that's just like a kitschy term. You know, <laughs> you know what would how would you, how would you position it? Yeah, it's kind of become like a buzzword or a trendy thing now. The ancestral living. But it doesn't mean going back and living like a caveman. I, I just want to make that point clear. <laughs> it's not going back, carrying a club around and, and looking like a caveman. That's, yeah. that's not what, to me, that's not what ancestral living is. Mm-hmm. To me, there's certain things from our environment, nature, any living thing expects certain things, certain, certain things from their environment in order to just have good health. Because good health is like that natural state of any living thing, whether it be a deer, a human, a dog. There's certain things from our environment that we just need. And ancestral living to me is just giving our bodies those things back. Because Mm -hmm. in the modern world, we we can talk about the nine tenants, but we are really disconnected in virtually every way possible that a healthy living thing should be to our Mm movements, to our nutrition. We're eating fake fake foods. We're we're doing fake movement. We're not moving. Uh, We're not getting the best sleep. We're highly stressed. And all these things, we're exposed to so many toxins. And all these things, we just need to learn how to really live in tune with our environment again. And I I don't say that to be like a hip hippie, whatever. It's just, I feel like this is what any healthy living organism needs. And if we can give our bodies that a little bit every day, we can get healthier. We can reduce chronic illness. We can reduce autoimmunity, like skin issues, digestive issues and more, because the way we live our lives matters in the terms of these things. And that's something that I think conventional medicine doesn't want you to to know that you can change your life through your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. You have to take this pill to to treat your illness, but what you do, what you eat doesn't influence how you how you feel and your symptoms that you have. So to me that's what ancestral living is. Mm. And even even hearing you say that that's so that was so good. And it's a journey, right? This ancestral living is a journey. It, it, it's so many people out there are going to hear that and be like, man, I, I just feel overwhelmed. I, I'm mm-hmm. not going to be able to make all the switches and throw everything away and buy everything new all today. And it's, it's a journey. It's, it's a, we find ourselves pretty deep in the ultra processed foods world. We find ourselves deep in a, I, I want to even, I just think that that example of being in class for nutrition and they're not being, maybe cross pollination is a bad word, but they're, they're just not talking to each other, mm. right? You've got one class that's teaching something that could potentially be a little bit like contrary to this, to the education coming from another class and you're working towards the same major. And it's like, man, that's, that's a problem that we're not, that we're not kind of going back and forth and cross-referencing each other and saying, Hey, I, I learned this thing that could have, that it could impact what you're teaching. Let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. And there's a part of me, the reason why I bring that back up is even, even saying things like, Hey, you know what? Our, our health department, our, our world of medical kind of intervention doesn't seem doesn't seem to want to tell us or push us in a direction of self-preservation or I don't know, what would you call that? Almost like preventative care, right? Of being able to set ourselves up. And, and, and the thought there would be, if, if you continue down that rabbit hole is it's going to cut into profits, it's going to cut into money. And I would even pose the idea that potentially, you know, I, I can't imagine there's none of that happening, right? I'm sure there's people out there that are like, man, it's great if people are sick because then we make more money, right? Well, this it is it is happening because there was a 2020 study um, that found that so the dietary guidelines are mm. 
what our curriculum is based off of. Mm. They started in the ni- in 1980, and every five years, the dietary guidelines are updated. And so, and then in 1992 is when the Food Guide Pyramid came out, and 2010 is when my plate came out, and that's mm. born out of the dietary guidelines. Well, a 2020 study found that 95% of those dietary guideline committee members have direct financial ties to big food and pharma. So oh. they they're getting financial kickbacks basically from big food companies Jeez. and and to make it worse, I mean the the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, uh, so dietitians at that academy is invested in big food companies like Coca Cola and Nestle, and it's there's it's it's a revolving door. It's it's pretty corrupt. Can we unpack deep. that for a second? Because I don't think people understand what the dietary guidelines are actually saying mm-hmm. because in my opinion they they prescribe ultra processed foods right like they are telling you that literally if you consume dairy it needs to be um, non-fat mm-hmm. so right away we're refining a dairy product um, they're totally cool with fortified uh, like soy, for- soy fortified alternatives for mm-hmm. dairy if you have any sort of meat, it needs to be lean meat. Again, we're not. We're taking away like the organ meats, the skin, the bones, the fat of any animal. Talk about how much waste that involves. If every American eats that way, like just eating the chicken breast, are you kidding? And then they're talking about the one thing where it's like not ultra processed is maybe that they're saying eat whole grains. But even that, I'm like, you're not talking about the proper mm-hmm. way to ferment those grains so that your body can actually absorb minerals after eating the thing you just ate. Um, what's another category? I mean, it, it blows my mind that our USDA dietary guidelines are written for everyone to read and everyone to see, and yet no one pays attention. And I think if they did, oh, the other one is fast. It's so mm-hmm. obvious. They're like, hey, you need to cut out all saturated fat. Mm-hmm. And the oils that you should be consuming are <laughs> corn and soy and safflower and sunflower, like every refined seed oil on the market. Yeah. The U.S. government is telling you that you should eat that. Yeah. Those are ultra processed foods. Mm-hmm. And then we look around, we wonder, why is everyone so ill? First of all, I don't think people are literally reading the guidelines and then going and acting on them because I don't think they know what the guidelines say. But the problem is that those guidelines influence public policy they influence what is labeled healthy at the store right they influence what your kindergartner is being fed at school they influence what people in um, any sort of institution are getting fed so yeah maybe the american public is unaware what the government is telling them but these things have impact and for me it's like the processed foods are the enemy and that is a real issue and that is one of the biggest ways that we are disconnected from yeah. our nature. You Absol- know? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so 50, just 50 years ago, if you went to the average grocery store, we had about 600 products in the average grocery store. Do you know how much we have today in oh the average gosh. grocery store? Probably 60,000. Yeah. I don't even it's know. It's 40 to 60,000. Oh. It's ridiculous. It's 10 times, 100 times the amount. Like it's, it's ridiculous. And and the problem with that is a majority of those are ultra processed foods. You can go up and down any aisle and it's going to have a long list of ingredients, usually soy, corn, wheat that have been ultra processed. And what ultra processed is, there's a difference between processed foods and ultra processed foods. In my opinion, ultra mm-hmm. processed foods are foods that have seen more of the inside of a factory than they have nature. You can't make these in your own kitchen. Mm-hmm. It's, it's turning, it's turning grains that you would grow out in a field into lucky charms. It's mm-hmm. you, you just, How do you do that in your own kitchen? And your biology doesn't know what to do with that. Sure, it has calories, it has certain macros, but that's something we can unpack there. What are the nutrients that's containing? How's that impacting your blood sugar? And so there has been reports in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association just a couple years ago reported that 70%, almost 68% of our children's 19 and under, 70% of their diet comes from these ultra processed foods. Mm. These are uh, sodas, cookies, chips, uh, you you name it. And even, I mean, adults over the age of 19, 60% of our diet is coming from these ultra processed foods, literally zero, a hundred, 150 years ago, we were just eating whole foods that were in our local environment, uh, animal fats, meats, certain veggies, if they were grown that year, fruits, uh, fermented foods, 
to now we can call up Uber Eats and just get whatever we want, fried food. And it's not to say that you can't ever have these, you know, everything has its place and its value, but to say that 70, 60 to 70% of our diet is, can come from these things and the government is kind of backed by that. There was just a study that the dietary guidelines put out that said that 91% of your diet can come from ultra processed foods and it can still be a healthy diet because you're meeting certain micronutrients. That just came out last year. Oh my. And you would think with the chronic, the health epidemic that we're having, where 60% of Americans have at least one chronic health condition, 40% have two or more chronic health conditions. You would think with that many people suffering, you think they wouldn't be recommending ultra processed foods as a part of their diet. But it goes back to some shady science done throughout the 1900s. Mm. And it's just, it's really messed up. But yeah, ultra processed foods, in my opinion, are, are kind of the culprit behind why we're struggling so much. And if we can just get back to eating real whole foods, whether that is a plant-based or animal-based, I, you know, I just think if you can get back to eating whole foods and cooking most of your foods in your kitchen, that will be light years better than, than any other diet that you can follow. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. There's so many natural ways our body protects us from things we shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. And I just, my only complaint is, is like, why are we not like repulsed by these things that are not doing us any justice or they're making us sick or that are keeping us malnourished? Why do we crave ultra processed foods so much? <laughs> yeah, they're, um, they're meant to be addictive. They're, they're designed to be addictive. In 1980, the same time those dietary guidelines came out, this is mind blowing to me. I learned this last year because there was a study that came out that found that, uh, so tobacco owners at that time, uh, Philip Morris and RJ Reynolds, they were the biggest tobacco owners in the industry at that time. They were very skilled at marketing cigarettes and tobacco to the public. They bought big food companies in 1980. And that study that, that found within the decade following by the early 2000s, these foods became a lot more hyper, hyper, hyper palatable. You couldn't put these foods down. They trick the pleasure, pleasure centers inside your brain. And so there's chemicals in there, the MSG, which is monosodium glutamate, the perfect combination of salt and carbs and fat. You can't put these down because they are designed. They have scientists designing these foods, literally creating these foods. So you can't put them down. It's eating Oreos. You can't eat just a few of them, uh, you know, Pringles. All these foods, you can't put them down. Mm. That's terrifying. Mm -hmm. And also, people should, you know, are we not the land of freedom? Like, who wants to be controlled by your processed food? Like, who doesn't want to have agency over every single bite of food that you're eating? Mm. I think the second, that, that should be a glass-shattering moment for you if you haven't heard that before of, like, the whole willpower conversation is always frustrating to me because it's not just purely willpower. There is actual engineering going on behind some of these foods. And it really bothers me. And I've talked about this at length before, but a lot of these hyper palatable ultra processed foods are geared towards children. Mm -hmm. So we are setting them up for failure. Like we are starting them off on freaking goldfish and Cheerios. And then we wonder why their health outcomes are poor. And it's it's a really frustrating point for me, but it's also when you when you don't have when you're younger, the ability to reason. Yeah. Or at least not not the same. And you you don't you've not fully developed your your ability to reason. Or your palate. And you're introduced to things like the goldfish, the the dino nuggets, the the you know mac Pop and cheese, Pop Tarts, right? Mm -hmm. And and then when, you know, Liz and Joey or, you know, Craig or so, someone in, intervenes and says, hey, you know what could really benefit you and your kids? This. And then that person goes like, wow, my reasoning tells me that makes sense. They go back and their kid's like, I mean, I mean you're talking about like fighting a war, mm -hmm. trying to get this kid now to convert. And it, it it's defeating. And so a lot of parents are are – trying to do the best that they can. They want their kid to eat. They want their kid to be nourished. They want their kid to be happy. They want them to be thriving. And every night they're going to, not, going to bed and they can't sleep because they didn't eat because they can't get themselves to eat that burger or that, you know, fish or whatever that, that they're not used to. And the chicken nuggets will just help them sleep at night. And I, 
I need to sleep at night and I got to get to work and I'm, you know, working two jobs and I'm, it's, it's a cycle that, that becomes really, really painful. And we've been learning more about this ever since we started posting things around, you know, kids food being a scam, kind of putting it up in quotes, right? Mm -hmm. Kids food is a scam, right? It's like these processed foods to help kids eat. And we've, you know, put, you know, Disney characters on them and we've, we've turned them into dinosaurs and, and, you know, it's it's stuffed food oh, in pouches like your kid doesn't need to know how to eat out of a pouch it's convenient but they don't need that skill and and then what happens is is your kids develop a sensory like adaptation to that thing and it's so hard to break it's so hard to break it's so hard to break and then when we come out and we say something like that people people are so offended and so frustrated because they're over there like i was just saying doing the honest work of parenting mm -hmm. and so you know salute to the parents out there that are out there getting after it being parents and and also right the argument i would make is not that you're doing a really bad job as a parent but that the context and culture that you're living in is surrounded and you're consumed by conveniences that yeah. end up becoming a crutch and, and potentially also a problem mm -hmm. and uh, anyhow yeah I, perfectly I am, said yeah, I am. I am totally on that board. So, ultra processed foods scientifically developed to be addictive, <laughs> and can't put them down. Now, what are, what are some of the nutrients you you were saying we could potentially unpack that a little bit? So, we're talking about Lucky Charm cereal, right? And there's uh, there's there's macros there, right? Everything has a macro of some kind. Uh, talk to me about the lack or loss of nutrients we might see in ultra processed foods versus you know maybe more of like a whole food. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can look on the back of any label and they'll have a list of the, the required nutrients on that label and it'll have the percent of your daily value. And people think that they're getting that in, but a lot of these are fortified with iron or B vitamins. And this, these are not that bioavailable. Your body's not able to absorb these properly because they might come in different forms. There's different forms of certain vitamins. And really when your body's eating just whole foods, they're coming packaged with tens of thousands of other nutrients mm. that help that assimilation, that absorption of those nutrients. Mm. So people enter this into their chronometer or, you know, my fitness pal, and they think that they're getting maybe mm. their, their recommended daily allowance of vitamin A, but that might've came in beta carotene where you might need retinol, you know, because that's more bioavailable and that's going to come from beef liver, as unappetizing as that might sound, or egg yolks or animal foods. Animal foods contain the most bioavailable nutrition that your body can find in the most mm -hmm. bioavailable forms. Um, but when you're eating ultra processed foods, these have literally been stripped of the, the most nutrition, even in plants. I mean, when you're fermenting like a sourdough bread or you're fermenting raw milk into kefir, kefir, uh, that's producing so many nutrients and enzymes and bacteria in there, beneficial bacteria, that your body's going to be able to digest that a lot better and absorb that. But when you're consuming grains, especially an ultra processed grain, like Lucky Charms or Cheerios, you could have digestive issues because your biology just doesn't know how to handle that. Mm -hmm. And it's not coming with the nutrition that it should. Mm -hmm. so, so what I'm hearing is that these, some of these foods are laced with what they are, you know, quote unquote, providing you unnaturally mm -hmm. so i've created this i'm imagining somebody in a laboratory with like a like a like a syringe of you know the xyz nutrient that's on the back of this label now putting it into your you know lucky charm or whatever and and we're just like crushing lucky charms uh, <laughs> but, but back in my day you know, I, I i totally Used vibed to with favorite. some lucky charms so mm -hmm. you know we got you but any regardless right um the the example still still is, is value i think and we eat that and we read the label we're entering into my fitness pal and while those nutrients kind of went through into our mouth they were not of they were not something that our body recognized and or were capable of wielding or utilizing is that yeah. is that what i'm hearing yeah absolutely and mm -hmm. and the same could be said for for protein too and you know, not to make this a little too confusing, but not all proteins are created equal. I mean, there's the thing called the, the protein digestible indispensable amino acid score. It's a mouthful, but basically scientists can test certain types of proteins, whether that's from meat or eggs or soy or wheat, and you can, your body absorbs those differently. So you might ingest 
20 to 30 grams, say 30 grams of a plant protein, whereas you're eating 30 grams of a meat protein, your body can actually use more of that animal protein than it can the plant protein. Mm -hmm. And so I want to meet people where they're at, but also understanding, you know, your body requires certain things in certain forms. And if you're not hitting your goals the way you want, whether that's weight loss, fat loss, or uh, skin issue goals or anything like that, I mean, the quality of the food you're eating matters most. And whole foods is, is by far the best thing that, that we should be eating. Why is there a discrepancy in how our body processes the protein in plants versus animals? Is it just one is complete and one is not? Or is there more to it? I think there's a little more to it. I mean, you can get a pea protein and that's a complete protein, um, but your body doesn't absorb that as well as protein from eggs or or meat, red meat. Um, our digestive tracts are a little different than an herbivore's digestive tracts. And this has been debated, but um, you know, we have one stomach that's pretty highly acidic. We have a long, small intestine and a short colon. And um, you know, I, I like Dr. Bill Schindler and his work that he's done. I don't know if you've had him on. Yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if he's explained this uh, to your guests, but um, he's done a fina- fascinating job explaining this. But our digestive tracts as humans, we've designed, we've kind of evolved over time to be able to ferment and prepare our plants externally because we haven't, des- we don't have the designed internal technology to kind of break some of these things down. That's why we ferment sourdough. Mm-hmm. Whereas maybe a cow has four stomachs and they have a, one of their stomachs is called a rumen. So they're designed to baby, uh, to digest that grass, burp it back up, re-swallow it into another stomach. So they have the internal technology to ferment. Uh, I would assume that why we don't break down certain, uh, proteins the same is because our digestive tracts are just different. And we've been designed to kind of digest plant proteins differently than animal proteins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I dig it. I um I always go back and forth when I'm when I'm taking care of like counting my macros if I should count any of my plant protein towards my overall protein goals or if I should just be focusing on animals. I think that's really interesting. So let's talk about consuming protein then. Let's talk about some of the meats and and kind of some of the the meat of this discussion if you will, which is which is organs. And mm. there's so much there's so much there's okay the liver king ex- exists, right? And there's there's people out there that are just on online taking big bites of of beef livers raw, yeah, and then lifting a bunch of weights, and they look super jacked. Uh, t- Craig, talk to me about organ meats. You know, how should we be consuming them? What what's kind of some of the benefits that they're providing us? And you know, help help me cut through some of this this uh, yeah this, yeah. this smoke. Yeah, for. Most of human history, I mean, and every culture you look at, even today with traditional culture tribes, we've really only lost this in more civilized cultures, but we've eaten the whole animal, nose to tail, organs and all, uh, for as long as we can really remember and longer before that. But this kind of goes back to starting our children's palates at a young age. We think of eating organs now as pretty gross because we didn't grow up eating organs, but there's Mm -hmm. cultures out there that still eat organs, liver, heart, kidney, spleen, pancreas, whatever the organs are, and they love it. But we kind of cringe at that now because we never grew up with that. But if you start reintroducing these things back into your diet and you can make them with some pretty good dishes, they tend to taste pretty hearty and pretty good, but you don't need as many calories from, you know, liver as you would from other foods to just get a certain amount of vitamin A. So you need to eat a little bit of liver just to get some of these nutrients in. Not a ton of calories, but you get a lot of micronutrients. So I get that this can sound so kind of weird for the listener if you're not on board with organs yet, but organs and eating animals nose to tail is something that we've always done because in a world of food scarcity before you know grocery stores, before having access to Uber Eats and 60,000 foods in our grocery store, calories were were important like we needed them so to waste any part of the animal would have been deadly for us and Mm -hmm. so we found a way to be able to consume as many calories as we could and organs just happen to be the most nutrient dense parts of the animal i mean you could look at any other species that you know hunts whether that is a lion or cheetah or tiger they go for the organs first because they Mm -hmm. know that's where they're going to get the most nutrition and then they leave the the muscle meats for other animals if they're they're full. 
But for us, we've really kind of forgotten about liver and heart and all these organs in our kind of Western society. But I think that's the thing with, you know, liver king and trying to put this message out into the world that uh, liver is, is king. Like it's the most nutritious food that we can really find. And that's what he's trying to push out into the world. And so if people can just start with liver and you don't have to eat the full thing. And that's kind of what we tell people at ancestral supplements is we get that it's, it's hard for people to just start eating liver. I, I personally like doing liver shooters. I cut it up into little chunks and just swallow it with water. I've been doing that since kind of my health journey in 2016 is when I started doing that. I killed my first deer and uh, I ate the liver of that deer and it was a really rewarding experience, which led me to find about ancestral supplements because they, they had just been founded in 2016 and I knew I needed to get more liver in my life. So I started taking ancestral supplements, but we understand that that's hard for people. They don't want to do that. And they, maybe they can't do that. They don't have access to liver. So that's why we wanted to kind of bridge that gap and get you a high quality liver supplement. Mm. The, the liver. Okay. So I also, there, there's this like weird um, hunting and you kill an animal. You feel differently about what you have just gathered, right? And ha this nose to tail mentality also in the same vein of calories are scarce and you can't like waste it. Like you just can't. Mm -hmm. There's also a very, there's almost like a guilt. I'm going to call it or, or a, to mm -hmm. honor the animal appropriately. When you are out in the, in the wild and hunting is a very imperfect act. There is no, there is, it's, it's hunting. It's not killing, right? If it was called killing, it'd be easy and it would be perfect. And you would not, there would be no it would work every time, every time. And it's called hunting and you put work, you put effort in and it's, it could be weeks and months and you could see nothing. And then you have that one chance, that one opportunity and it's a beautiful creature. And, and then you, I mean, even getting it, getting it home can be crazy amounts of effort and, and output and the amount of calories in to bring a deer home. I, I mean, it's like, it's crazy, right? The, 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 the balance there is very, in my opinion, normal. Whereas the amount of calories that output to get DoorDash to your door is like <laughs> zero, right? <laughs> and so when you do that, bringing that liver home, for me to tell somebody that, you know, the heart, the organs, very, very transparently, I'm still not a huge liver fan. And I've been hunting deer since like, you know, I was 16. The heart is where it's at. Mm -hmm. Way better flavor. Heart is fire, right? It tastes but. great. If you, in my opinion, it just tastes good. Um, liver, man, I'm I'm working on it. I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get there. The the the, uh, the flavor of it, it's I'm still working on it. However, the value you have on those things totally changes, and I think that is also a very important factor. That if you have not experienced what Craig is talking about, where you've taken an animal and you've brought it home, some of these other aspects of the animal just the, the value of them, they're not the same. Yeah. Yeah. One of the best things that I've done in the past or for my health and my nutrition is getting more connected to that food, whether that is a plant or an animal and just learning where that food comes from, visiting mm. my local farmer's markets, mm. making my own bread, sourdough, or fermenting my own milk into kefir, um, all those sorts of things, hunting and just understanding what goes into that. You appreciate your food so much more. And if you aren't at that point yet where you can grow a garden or harvest honey from your bees or hunt, go visit a farmer's market and mm -hmm. just experience what went into it. Because then you'll realize, I mean, it was a realization for me. And this wasn't like an aha moment, but it was just, I think, a gradual shift over time. The more I started to do this, I realized, and, and I'm blessed to be able to grow up with a, a dad and guys in my family that do hunt. I've been doing that since a young age. And I really got to see firsthand what goes into that. And what goes into maybe growing a garden? What goes, you have to wait. And you were mentioning about the, the calorie expenditure. I mean, to, to what it would take to, to grow a garden or to, to harvest tubers, the amount of calories that you expend to get those versus the amount of calories and, and the return on investment that you would get from those plants, then the amount of calories that you have to expend to, to hunt, and then the amount of calories that you get back, it's far more worth it for our ancestors to have hunted because they got hundreds of thousands, if not millions of calories, depending on the size of the animal, they would get that back and they could feed their family. They mm -hmm. got to see where that, that came from, that the source of nutrition came from. But yeah, I mean, just getting closer to your food is one of the best things that you can do. 
That's so true. I mean, you think about it back in the day. The, the, there's also this, like my great, my, my grandparents, this hunting thing has been passed down for generations. And there's things that just don't, you don't lose in that kind of legacy, right? Mm -hmm. And one of them being this idea of wasting, right? Mm -hmm. And you wonder where that came from, right? And it's, it's, if you've hunted and you've attained and you've gotten this thing, now I'll tell you, if you door dash a burger and it's not so good, it's so easy to, to, to be like, ah, this, I didn't really, I mean, I didn't really invest much in it. To discard this. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're like, meh. Nah, Versus fine. if you, you know, hunted an animal and you've been, let me, when, I, when I'm deboning that thing out in my backyard, we are getting every bit of meat off of that animal. I'm not like, eh, you know, I'm feeling kind of tired today. There's no way I'm doing that. There's no way I'm doing that. There's, there's, yeah, that, that's a really good idea. This idea of calorie output to the value that you place on that, I don't know, whatever it is, whatever the return on investment is. Yeah. Right? But you just want to honor the animal too. Yeah. As you had mentioned, I mean, you just want to, it makes you want to be a better person because you think mm -hmm. I just kind of took this life and it's going to nourish my family and I want to be, I want to be a good person now and kind of honor mm -hmm. that. That's kind of the way mm -hmm. I, I see it. That's so good. Yeah. We went from, I, I, back to your point of like getting closer to your food, even if you don't hunt and you just buy like bulk beef, right? You're like, I'm going to buy half a cow. You have to say, hey, I'm wasting those organs. Or you have to tell the butcher, save the organs for me. And I think that when we transition to grocery store meat and everything's wrapped in that cellophane and it's all cut and butchered for you, uh, yeah, the organs are out of sight, out of mind. You're not going to the counter to buy half a heart or a, or, or a pound of liver. It's removed. And I think another interesting shift in probably what would have been more of a source of organ meats are like sausages or liverwurst or hot dogs. And if I I'm, like, I remember growing up thinking like a hot dog, that's like with all the odd bits and ends and that's gross and that's probably low quality meat. Whereas back in the day, that was probably the best utilization of some of those really nutrient dense meats. But for some reason, society completely demonized the the sausage, the hot dog, the whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And and to that point, I mean, now, I mean, these quote unquote processed meats, you know, the hot dogs, the sausages, they're full. Some of a lot of them are full of whatever ingredients that might not be the best for you, the how they're they're cured, the nitrates and everything mm -hmm. like that. It's not the same. I mean, mm -hmm. we've mm -hmm. we've sacrificed health for convenience and profit. And that's mm -hmm. what all these ultra processed foods are. And you could even say the same about processed foods. So when a lot of these studies are done determining how these foods impact our health, yeah, they lump kind of all these processed foods together. Whereas you can go get high quality sausage from your far farmer's market. It's not going to be the same thing as your whatever at the grocery store, more mm -hmm. than likely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your Bob Evans, whatever. Yeah. Your... It's so interesting too, because the world of greenwashing is becoming so crafty. Dude, the the simple truth, I just have to call it out. The simple truth Kroger sausages had silicone dioxide in them. I don't even know what that is, but I was like, and, and people see the simple truth thing and they think that means it's also organic, but it's not. You know what I'm talking about? And I mean that even organic now is becoming like a label that you have, it's like you, you, you turn that organic food around and read the label. You're like, the ingredients of this organic food are astounding to it's me. It's tricky. So, so I've got a really funny story that I'm going to tell, and I, I've been saving this. We almost did a whole podcast on it. I think we are, so I think you should save it. I'm gonna I'm gonna give the give the give the spark notes. Oh, okay. So I uh, took my seven year old to the grocery store. Oh, I don't even remember why. Anyways, we're there, and she was wanting to buy a treat, which we do not do very often, which is why it's such a big story that I took her to the grocery store, <laughs> and we walked down the ice cream aisle, <clears throat> big freezer section, and they've got all of the, you know, pies and, and I don't know. Uh, novelties. Novelties, thank you. And she immediately went to the pies. Because there were these big pictures of like these Marie Calendar. delicious frozen pies. And she finds this one that's chocolate mousse pie. And she grabs it. She's like, Dad, I want this. And I was like, I was like, okay. I don't know if she's old enough for this to work yet, but we're going to talk about it. I'm like, okay. I was like, let's, let's see what, let's see how they made it. I was like, I was like, Ruthie, have you made chocolate mousse pie? Of course. 
in our family. She has. She made it with her with, with her nana and with her sister before. So she has made chocolate chocolate mousse pie before and remembers what ingredients went in to make it, and she loves it. It's super good. Now she was not able in her current age to read a lot of the things that were on the back of that label, but I read it. And the look on her face as I was reading off all of these words, like here, I was like, hey, I was like, Ruthie, you want to know what's inside this pie? She's like, well, sure, Dad. It's you know, it's cream and it's it's uh, you know, flour and cr- you know, vanilla. And she started naming off the things. She's like, sometimes Nana puts a little bit of rum in it, right? And so she's like, she's naming off all the things, <laughs> and and I started reading it. And she's like, that's that's none of the things that Nana uses. And she looked at me and she was like, she's like, Dad, we can't get this pie. And I was like, okay. And she's like, well, Dad, this is the organic ice cream. We'll get this because she's you know, shopped with us long enough. I was like, all right, Ruth. And I pull her, I turn around the ice cream. I read the label. She's like, so what? We can't eat anything? She's like, this, this, this ice cream is not. I was like, I was like, but Ruthie, it's organic. Should we still eat it? She's like, she kind of like looked at me and she thought I was like telling her it was okay. She's like, yes. And I was like, well, what do you think? Would you, do, can you make this ice cream? She's like, I don't know. Where, where do you find, where do you buy? It had, it had like soy lectin and like, is that how you pronounce it? I don't that? remember. And, so, but... and a bunch of other additives in it. Whereas there was a non-organic version, but it was literally just cream, sugar, eggs. What yeah, else? It was like whole ingredients. And Ruthie's like, oh, that one sounds good. And I was like, oh my gosh. Ruthie has figured out that if I can make that at home, I inevitably can can use that as a way or like a litmus test of, yes. oh, this one would be maybe more appropriate for me. Yes. And anyhow, the, the, the greenwashing world has become so insane. It, There's uh-huh. brands that will garner your organic or capture or pull in your trust because they've spent the money for all this marketing and positioning and man it's it's like a it's like a crazy world out there mm-hmm. no i love that story so much and i wish i mean more kids if they could make that association and just be able to know how to read a label and know i mean to be able to cook your own food at home and know if if that's you can't read a label and understand what's in there, then maybe, maybe not, you know, mm-hmm. that's, that's amazing. And I'm not here to like demonize all the ingredients that I don't understand because, because at the end of the day, I don't know them, but that was one of the ways I felt safest was I don't even know what that is. And, and that was also the, the way you saw a seven-year-old that has zero, like, you know, she, she is, she's not really sure, but she was thinking to herself, man, I've made that before. Here's how I made it. And that has the ingredients that, that we use to make ice cream with my, she makes ice cream with her, mm-hmm. her grandpa sometimes or mm-hmm. at home. Yeah. And she's like, I've made that. Those are the ingredients that we put in for ice cream. I don't even know what that stuff is. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyways. I think even breaking it down for kids and saying like, listen, there are ingredients in foods that make it more shelf stable, that make the texture better because it has to last on a shelf longer, that make it you know, preserved longer versus ingredients that are there for your nutrition. And there's a difference like in that. I wish it could be broken down in a nutrition label. Like this is because it's a packaged food and this is the actual food bit in it. Um, but she's slowly learning that over time as she kind of reads the labels and sees what's up. Before we get people too terrified here by the world is ending and everything is garbage, let's uh, let, let's let's change gears here a little bit. And Craig, how do we? How would you recommend incorporating ancestral living into people's that's whether no regardless wherever they're on where, wherever they are on their journey? What are some of your easiest go tos to kind of get this thing started? Yeah. Yeah. I think the first thing is just understanding and becoming aware of that there is an issue in the first place. And I think if, you know, people are tuning into your podcast, they're aware that there needs to be a change and that how I live my life can impact my symptoms and how Mm. the quality of life that I have. And so then once you realize that, then you kind of come to the realization, oh, there's a lot of toxicity in the world, not to be a Debbie Downer, but there, our modern world does have a lot of toxins and pollutants in it from whether that be the wi-fi or microwaves whatever you know um to the the chemicals in our food um, what we spray on our yards it can seem very very overwhelming and you might just get so so overwhelmed that you maybe don't react like don't take any uh, action at all Mm. and so there's but there's so many simple solutions that you can just implement right now and some of my favorites i mean we can go through the nine tenants and this is virtually just the the things that I, I explained earlier that our biology needs from from our environment, this is just so I'll go through the tenants and then I'll kind of just break down maybe a couple of them and help people where they're I at. Love it. So the first tenant is sleep, and then we go eat, 
move, shield. Shield is just kind of like protecting ourselves from these toxins. Connect, and it's connecting to the earth. Then we have cold, but this should really be thermal pressures because it's just getting our bodies cold or hot depending on our environment. Um, sun is seven and just getting outside, getting exposed to the sun. Then number eight is struggle. It's just, you know, what kind of, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Mm. And then the last one is bond, just bonding with your friends and family. So mm. if you can get all these dialed in and it, you don't need to be perfect, right? This isn't a perfect journey, but if you can get just like 1% better every day, mm. then your life can be so exponentially better. And so with nutrition, I've kind of come to this kind of conclusion just over the years, but I've tried different diets. I've tried different ways of eating, what works best for me. And again, there's not one diet that works for everybody. I just want to be clear. Uh, but I believe there is kind of a framework that can work for most people. And to me, that's just whole foods. And that framework is really just eating what's local and in season to you. And I mm -hmm. think if people can kind of just maybe set the grocery store aside, and I know that's where 99% of people are going to get their food. But if you can set that aside and just ask yourself, what's in my local environment? What can I get here? Can I grow produce this time of year? Can I get meat this time of year? Can I get dairy? How can I make sourdough? Things like that. That's where I would start for most people. And that there, we can break that down even more. But for the dietary piece, that that's where I would start is maybe visit your local farm, go go to realmilk.com and, and check out, you know, where you can get raw milk in your area, depending on your state's legalities. Um, but if you can't, go to your grocery store. And my best suggestion is to shop the perimeter because all the ultra processed foods are going to be in the center. Usually the perimeter is veggies, meats, dairies, things that aren't as ultra processed. That's what I would do on the dietary front. Then you can go through the other tenants, sleep. We can talk about the quality of sleep, how we just need to move our bodies, um, stress reduction, things like that. But, but really, I think on the dietary front, that's, that's where I'd start. Mm. That's so good. Remind me um, the connect to the ground. Am I remembering that right? Yeah, the earthing earthing okay so like a grounding element and then the thermal pressures yeah i really like that tenant where this would be where maybe a cold plunger a sauna element might mm. come into play where we're um putting pressure on our biology in either way to either detox or i don't really know all the benefits of cold plunging although i've heard them repeated multiple times so that's interesting that those are all in there um mm. yeah that's cool we don't need to go to the, I, I think it might scare some people if you've never cold plunged or done a sauna before, but um, this, we call this thermal pressures um, really just because in our environment today, I mean, we go from climate controlled environments to other climate controlled environments. We yeah. go to air conditioned or heated homes to a heated or air conditioned car to another building that's, you know, so, but our ancestors didn't have that luxury. Just mm -hmm. 50, 70 years ago, whatever it may be, we didn't have that luxury. So whatever the temperature was, we kind of had to adapt. Mm -hmm. And our biology expects that. And you don't need to suffer or be miserable. It's just kind of putting your body, sweating a little bit, putting your body in you know, elements that, that it might not normally be exposed to. Because mm -hmm. we have cold shock proteins, heat shock proteins that really help our immune system, our detox pathways, the list goes on and on. So mm -hmm. that's why we encourage that tenant, because that's just one piece of, of health. It could be even going for a walk on a non super weather ideal day. Mm -hmm. Like it's a little brisk and you know, you're outside in it and you're kind of bundled up. It's uncomfortable, but you're right. I mean, I don't even think my dad had AC growing up. Like it was just like summertime. It's hot. You should be hot in your house. But nowadays, right. Our, our houses are controlled. Yeah. You mentioned a walk, up. but that's a good way that you can knock out all the tenants because mm. I should have mentioned that the tenants are really just what our ancestors did unknowingly. That's just how they lived their lives. They ate a certain diet. They slept a certain way. They've moved a certain way. They, they were required to move to either get their food or to do whatever they had to do to play. Um, they were always in the sun for the most part or shade. They were always connected to the ground because when we wear rubber soled shoes or live in high rise buildings, we're disconnected from the earth. So th these tenants are really just ways to just get back to how humans should be living or any living thing should be living. Mm -hmm. But if you just go on a walk in the sun barefoot, you're knocking out half the tenants right there. I love that. That's habit stacking, right? That's what they call that in the wellness. Right? Habit stacking. <laughs> right on. That's awesome. Hey, so we're, we're talking about these, these nine ancestral tenants to kind of like wrap the, or tie a bow on that. And, and the, 
the kind of the thought there is if you've got yourself if you've if you've got these things lined out or or considered on a regular basis and you're making incremental improvements on a regular basis that is one of the ways towards pursuing this this more you know i, I asked this question at the beginning right of like how do we define health and i'm not sure that that i have a great definition for that but i think that oftentimes that's where i would ask people to start is like define where you want to get to in health right is it i want to increase energy is it that i want to uh, like i want to lose weight i want to gain weight i want to i want to have you know reduced brain fog i want to like there's so many objectives or goals that you can have and i and i feel like that that in and of itself is a is a very important part because you know motivation is meaningless without a motive right something to help you kind of identify where you're going and why you're doing it uh, that being said uh, i love that i love having those kind of uh, tenets or these kind of different buckets that we can be aware of on a regular basis to i don't know kind of give us some guiding principles or 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 a uh, uh, a roadmap of, of where to get started. Mm -hmm. So that that's super super yeah. cool. Talk to me about ancestral supplements now. So we've got we've gone through a lot of this discussion now of just our world today. Some of some of the ups and downs, pros and cons, things that that, that we've learned and and and, uh, and maybe mistakes we've made. But talk about ancestral ancestral supplements. You've been there now for about you said two years, a little years. over two years, yeah, a little over two years. Um, you know, talk to me about ancestral su supplements. Yeah. So I started with them, um, January of 2022. Uh, I just sent an email and I, I, you know, was flown out. They liked my story. Um, I vibed with them. I got hired and I really kind of bounced back and forth. I worked for liver King and his team. I was kind of his PR guy for a while, no kidding. but they saw my talents here and they wanted me to kind of start doing this and, and kind of really help ancestral and, and educate the world on ancestral living like I'm doing now. And so that's when I've been back here for the past over past year. And so uh, really Ancestral Supplements was founded in 2016, I believe. And we've had virtually all the same products that we've had then. I think we have 26 or 27 SKUs, but virtually all the organs that we can really get. And we do our best. And we've done this over the past you know, nine or 10 years now uh, to source them from virtually New Zealand pastures. So we want to make sure that the sourcing is the highest quality possible because New Zealand is so far out in the middle of nowhere. There's really no mm. pollution getting to it. Um, there's no better place to source organs from than there. Um, so we source there. Uh, we make sure that they're regeneratively raised, all the good kind of labels that you would want to look for. And we do third-party testing as well to make sure that there's nothing nefarious kind of getting in the supplements because the supplement industry isn't very well regulated. And we just want to make sure that we're trying to, we're putting out the highest quality product that we can um, that give people the benefits that they love. Mm, I love that. And you guys have amazing products. It's not just encapsulated liver. I mean, the one I have sitting right here is bone and marrow, right? You have, and then I have like a general beef organ where it's like a mixture of a bunch. You can, you can target heart and spleen. You can target whatever you want. Um, and I think that's a really cool thing that I don't see a lot of other places offering where I can really d dive in and get specific with what I'm supplementing with, which is really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. We love to have those, those, the blends, but we also love to have the targeted support as we call it, whether that's just liver or thyroid or heart, whatever that may be, because people reach out all the time and they just want targeted support for their skin or their heart or their teeth or what have you. And we want to be able to give them that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we, we do our best to, to give them that. Love that. Where can people find Ancestral Supplements and learn more from you? Yeah. So uh, Ancestral Supplements, I mean, we have our website and we're on virtually every social media platform now on YouTube at Ancestral Supplements. Uh, myself, I'm at Craig underscore McCloskey. I'm most active on Instagram, Facebook, and a little bit on TikTok. Cool. Right on. Craig, thank you so much for coming out. And this has been an outstanding conversation. My guess is, is we'll be hearing from you or talking to you at some point here in the future, but, uh, you know, I super appreciate it. All the wisdom and lessons learned and, uh, you know, man, until next time. Thanks guys. And with that, Craig McCloskey has left a virtual chat. What a sweet guy. Yeah. He was yeah, outstanding. So human. fun to talk to. Outstanding. Bring him on again. <laughs> Already just right Already, now. Round two. Yeah. Start it back up. Start it back up. I love that. I loved his, his 
I really enjoyed hearing his story going to school and some of the discrepancies that he was seeing. Mm -hmm, That was interesting. I find that really interesting. And I like to give people the benefit of the doubt where I can. And I do believe there's got to be much more. We don't talk enough. It's hard to steer this ship. It's hard to turn the ship around going on than than we even know. Mm. And uh, I don't know. Somehow I like that. I like to believe that humans tend to be at least somewhat good and happy you're a positive person i am a positive person so, you know i tend to be like yeah it's all built into the system <laughs> it's <You> all <laughs> i'm sure if you've listened to the show long enough you know that that's kind of it's all thing. greed everybody wants our money and our health to joey's mr plummeting. positive and liz is a little spicy but that's all right anyways ancestral supplements um i genuinely have been taking their products for years i just happened to bring down two of the bottles that were in our kitchen and i just took some beef organs while we were Chit chatting after we uh, signed off. So, um, highly recommend them. Go check out their vast line of supplementation mm. on their website because they have a lot of cool products. And uh, yeah, it's a great combo. Right on. Hey, if you like the show, you can leave us a review. That helps us, helps us kind of push it out to other people, mm-hmm. helps people find us for awesome interviews to get other folks on if you have a suggestion of someone you're interested in hearing on the show i don't know why i'm on this right now but i'd be very curious to hear what who folks would love to hear from yeah we've got a lot of really cool guests lined up so maybe even your suggestions are already in the hopper Mm. however would love to hear from y'all on who you'd like to hear from additionally we have other ways you can support the podcast and support yourself we have more content that we create in the form of our Substack. Go find that on our Instagram page. It's linked. Or can you just look it up on our website? I mean, how, how else can so you find Substack? So you can go to substack.com and search homegrown education and you will find our like profile, I think is what it kind of is. Mm-hmm. But we drop uh, an entire new episode almost weekly on Substack and we call those coffee chats. And they're like 10 to 30 minute episodes where it's just me and Joey getting straight to a point. And they've been really, really fun to record. Honestly, some of my favorite content we've done in a while because it lets us just go ham on Mm. one subject and really dive into some of the nuance there and um, maybe challenge the audience a little bit more Mm -hmm. than how we have challenged them on the broader podcast. So if you're interested in that, it's $8 a month or $6 a month when you pay for the full year. Right on. Check out the Substack. We've got shoptheh.com is a online retail company we've created to help improve your home goods as you're on this journey as you're kind of investing in a non-toxic living that's what we got there shoptheh.com everything from your dish soap to your body soap to your coffee and your tea sourdough tools go check out shoptheh.com get yourself some awesome stuff get yourself set up get your friends set up right you're making sourdough we got you and finally, we've got education. We've got curriculum. We've got books that we've written and created for you and for your kids. That's at homegrowneducation.org. That's for everything from meal planning to recipes to homeschool curriculum. You can sit down with your kids to teach them about real food and where it comes from. We've got Instagram if you want to hear more from us. I mean, if you haven't heard enough, and I totally get it, man. It's like, man, please don't go. Please don't end this episode. <laughs> no one's saying that. There's so many people listening right now. Not a are, single soul. There's so many people listening right now. They're like, please don't go. <laughs> please, please don't make it end. And you can go check us out on Instagram. I post things like running and drinking coffee. I think Joey has the most boring Instagram account I have ever personally seen. And I say that as someone who loves you dearly if in real you life. follow me on Instagram. But he's so boring. Tell me how I can help you. Because, because he posts the same thing every day. I'm not the creative content creator person. And so what you see is literally me. It's what you get. There is no curated factors going on. So if you want raw Hazelmeyer content, you can check out my Instagram. I'll try to share more of you on my account. I don't know if that's what people need right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Elizabeth has a much better, more interesting account, and that is homegrown underscore education. And she also has a personal account, Liz Hazelmeyer. And until next time, friends, that's a wrap.